Everybody knows William Shakespeare, the playwright and poet, one of the greatest figures in all of English literature. In London, the reconstructed Globe Theatre stands as a monument to Shakespeare's achievement. But Shakespeare just happens to have lived at a remarkable time, the period that we now look at as the beginning of the scientific revolution. It's true that many of the ideas of the medieval world were still very much alive in Shakespeare's day. For example, magic and astrology were just about everywhere. But at the same time, new ideas were on the horizon. Ideas about the human body, the earth, and the universe. Ideas that would soon transform Western thought. Maybe Shakespeare was more conscious of those ideas than we usually imagine. Of course, Shakespeare wasn't a scientist. That word didn't even exist in Elizabethan times. But a handful of scholars are now examining Shakespeare's interest in the natural world, asking how much he knew, when did he know it, and how that knowledge might be reflected in his work. Take astronomy, for example. Shakespeare's plays are full of references to the sun, the moon, and the stars. He even talks about comets and eclipses. But these references are usually dismissed as strictly old school. That is, scholars have usually thought of them as reflecting the ancient ideas of the Greek philosophers. When Shakespeare talks about the universe, it often sounds like he's talking about the Earth-centered view described by thinkers like Aristotle and Ptolemy, who had been dead for 14 centuries. And yet, newer ideas were in the air. In 1543, 21 years before Shakespeare was born, Nicholas Copernicus had published his bold theory, declaring that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the cosmos. Now, ideas traveled a lot more slowly in Shakespeare's day than they do now, but even so, the Copernican theory had a number of early supporters in England. One of them, a man named Thomas Diggs, went even further than Copernicus by suggesting that the universe was infinite, that the stars might just keep on going and going, forever. We don't know for certain what Shakespeare thought about that idea, but one of his plays may offer at least a tantalizing hint. In Hamlet, the prince envisions himself as a king of infinite space. Could Shakespeare be alluding to the new infinite universe described for the first time by his countryman Thomas Diggs? Scholars have long noted that Shakespeare had a number of connections to the Diggs family. For a time, they lived just a few blocks apart in London in the 1590s. And Diggs's son, Leonard, was a fan of the playwright. When the first collection of Shakespeare's plays was published, the famous First Folio, Diggs's son, Leonard, contributed a brief poem in praise of Shakespeare. Another intriguing figure is the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. Although Tycho wasn't a Copernican, he did reject the ancient Earth-centered view of the Greek philosophers. Tycho Brahe was the greatest of the pre-telescopic observers. He carried out his observations from his grand observatory built on an island in the channel between present-day Denmark and Sweden. Tycho's island was just a few miles away from the castle of Helsinor, in English Elsinore, the castle chosen by Shakespeare as the setting for Hamlet. There's no evidence that Shakespeare ever visited Denmark, but some of the performers in his acting company did. And so did his future patron, King James, although James was only the King of Scotland and not yet the King of England when Shakespeare was writing Hamlet. It's also worth taking a close look at Tycho Brahe's family. This engraving of Tycho dates from 1590. Around the outer perimeter, you can see the crests of some of Tycho's relatives. And if you take a close look, you find that two of those relatives were named Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. When you add it all up, it looks like there's at least some kind of connection between Shakespeare and the Danish astronomer.
Another important scientific figure in Shakespeare's time was the Italian astronomer Galileo. Galileo's telescopic observations seemed to lend decisive support for the Copernican view of the cosmos. Now, Galileo only published his observations in 1610, and by that time William Shakespeare's career was winding down. But it wasn't quite over yet. A few scholars have pointed to the late play Cymbeline as a work that might contain allusions to Galileo's groundbreaking discoveries. Again, science was just in its infancy in Shakespeare's time. But some of his characters do sound remarkably modern. For example, when they speak out against superstition, the way Cassius does in Julius Caesar, and the way Edmund does in King Lear. In many ways, Shakespeare's universe was still, to use Carl Sagan's phrase, a demon-haunted world. But new ideas were beginning to take hold. Now, as we celebrate the 450th anniversary of the playwright's birth, why not take a closer look at the science of Shakespeare? Shakespeare.